Thank you so very much for being here. Take your Bible tonight and turn with me, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 10. John, chapter 10 in the Scripture. John, chapter 10 in the Word of God. And as you're turning there, all the children can follow Mrs. Gray and Mr. Peter out the back door for children's Bible time. John chapter 10 in the scripture. And let's bow together and ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word, shall we? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd guide your servant tonight. I pray that you'd work in a very unusual way and draw us close to your heart. Help me, Lord, as I preach, not to preach in the arm of the flesh and in my own understanding, but to trust you implicitly and completely. Lord Jesus, we'll be careful to honor you and praise you for what you do. Lord, I pray tonight that if there is someone in this place who is lost and without Christ, that tonight before they leave, they would trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd help Christians to be strengthened, those that are discouraged, trying to stand for what's right in this old wicked and lost world. Help them, Lord, to be encouraged in the work that you've called them to do and the place that you've set them. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that's saved, but just walking, drifting away from you, I pray that tonight you'd throw your cords of love around them and draw them back to you. And Lord, we'll be careful to honor you and give you the glory and the praise for what you do Because we ask this in Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Corey Ten Boom was someone who had been taken prisoner during World War II by the Germans and taken prisoner and put in a Nazi prison camp with her sister. She had grown up in the Netherlands and because they had hidden Jews, they were taken off to these prison camps and it was an amazing display of the cruelty of mankind. She writes, it was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland with the message to defeated Germany that God forgives. It was the truth that they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins are thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence. In silence, they collected their wraps. In silence, they left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward toward me against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, I saw a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back to me with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man and the other guards. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy... How thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. 
he would not remember me. He would not remember me. Of course, how could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I'd been face to face with one of my captors and my blood ran cold. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I, I have become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I whose sins had every day to be forgiven. Could he just be forgiven for the asking? Betsy died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But for me, it was an eternity as I rest with, wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do that. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that, that we must forgive others. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical or emotional scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And still, still I stood there with my coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I pray. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. It seems to me that forgiveness is one of the hardest things a Christian faces. Yet it's the one centerpiece of our faith. It's the one characteristic that sets us as Christians apart from the rest of all the religions. It's the one characteristic that sets our Savior apart from all the other false gods worshipped in this world and all the other false prophets that men seem to follow. But forgiveness is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ expects of you and me. And there are times in our lives when God, through his grace and mercy, sends someone, maybe a preacher, maybe a child, maybe an experience, maybe the still small voice of the Holy Spirit to interrupt our anger. I want you to turn back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 28 tonight. And for a few moments, I want to preach to you on the subject, when God interrupts your anger. When God interrupts your anger. I want you to see this passage unfold tonight in all of its detail and horror. Second Chronicles chapter number 28 in the Old Testament recounts Ahaz, the king. He was the king of Judah. The Bible says he was 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Baalim. 
verse number 3 of 2 Chronicles 28. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Wherefore, the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. Now, this passage details in its fullness great rebellion against Almighty God. Rebellion committed by Ahaz, the king of Judah. He himself was a rebel against God. He led his nation and his family and anybody that would follow in rebellion against God. And yet it was during Ahaz's reign that Isaiah the prophet was preaching. It was during Ahaz's reign that men stood and thundered forth the righteousness of the Lord. It was during Ahaz's reign that God's faithful people suffered the consequences of this wicked man. The Bible speaks first about the hellish rebellion in this passage. It speaks about the hellish rebellion of Ahaz. It speaks about his rebellion and the fact that he did not that which was right. Verse 1, he walked in the ways of all the kings of Israel. Now that was a very, very strong indictment. You see, the kings of Israel in large part were wicked kings. If it says he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, it was almost as if he was saying he was walking in the ways of the pagan kings because many of the pagan kings, uh, many of the kings of Israel lived like pagan kings. In verse number 2, it says he made also molten images for Balaam. Whenever you find that little suffix I am at the end of a word, it's a plural ending in the Hebrew. So it just doesn't mean the worship of another false god or one false god. It's the worship of many false gods. Balaam in the groves and the high places under every green tree, the Bible says. He worshiped false gods. It says later in this text that he set up an idol in every corner of Jerusalem. Now, if you and I bring out a superlative like that, it, is, it, is a, it has a great chance of being wrong. But when God says under every green tree and in every corner, he's making a strong point that this nation was slammed full of idolatry. Not a pagan nation, Judah. Not a pagan people, the people of God. And at the helm of this idolatry was Ahaz. In verse number 3, it says he burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire. You say, is that human sacrifice? Yes, it's human sacrifice. The king of Judah is leading them in human sacrifice, burning his children in the fire. By the way, I want to put all the liberals on report right now and on record and serve notice that we don't buy the lie when they come on with their politicians and say, we want to do this for the children. Right. Nothing could be further from the truth. And you mark it down, liberalism in this country, I speak of an idea and I can speak, I can speak as plainly as the Bible does. Liberalism as an idea is wicked. It, it was hatched in the bosom of hell. It is not something that will help America on every front and in every count. It is hurting America Amen. when they come on with their new morality and they want to start the Me Too movement. Look here, look here. I'm against women being molested and raped and mistreated and sexually abused. But you mark it down, those that are the most immoral oftentimes are now the ones telling us about morality. Right. Excuse me, I, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. And, and I'm certainly not going to stand shocked, amazed that Hollywood had this kind of lifestyle going on. Right. No, of course they did because yeah. they promote it on every one of their shows. Yeah. And, and, and then they come on with their new morality. They want to tell you that it's wrong to kill a whale, but it's okay to kill a baby. Right. They want to tell you that it's wrong to have Cheez-Its and trans fat and a uh, supersized drink, but it's okay, it's okay to have marijuana. It, it's okay. It's a bunch of baloney, yeah. pure, unmitigated baloney. Yeah. I, was in, uh, I was in California last year, and I was flying from, from San Francisco area down to L.A., and there was, a, <clears throat> there was a, a lady sitting next to me. I began to talk to her and, and be friendly, try, strike up a conversation. She said <clears throat> that she was a model. And she was, she was very, very skinny. Like it looked unhealthy, the skinny, skinniness. And, I, and, and by the way, a little fat is not a bad thing. Can I get an amen right there? <laughs> so, so anyway, she was a model. I'm not sure what for, but uh, she was a model. And so I began to talk to her and began to strike up conversation. And she began to tell me about her background. She said her boyfriend was on the flight and he was up just a few 
couple rows ahead. I'm not sure why they were sitting in different places, but they were. And we began to talk, and, and, uh, and, and she told me that she had some disease, but what was really helping her disease was marijuana and cannabis. Now, now look, I'm not going to get into a big, big debate about all that, but she said her boyfriend, since it was California, had a cannabis business, uh, a byproduct of marijuana, and cannabis candy, and boy, it was going great guns. I said, I'm sure it is. <laughs> and so, so uh, anyway, she said, oh, it's just great, because you know it's legal in California. Well, then she was telling me about her disease and how certain things would really trigger her disease, and, and I, I understand there's a reality with all that. But she said, whatever you do, she said, don't let your boys eat cheeseburgers. That's the worst thing that you could possibly <laughs> let them eat. And then in the course of conversation, she said, and she said, Cheez-Its, Cheez-Its, this is about the most awful thing you can ever eat or let anybody eat. Well, then, then I find out that she's living with her boyfriend, that she's smoking pot, and she might have been smoking it not too long before this flight. And, um, and, uh, and then I, she began to talk to me. She said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm an evangelist. She said, what's that? I, I said, I'm a preacher. Oh, she said, I want to talk to her. So I thought, man, she's going to get saved. This is wonderful. Well, I just tried to explain her just the basic, basic gospel, how Jesus died. It was just like the lamb that died in the Old Testament. And, and, and she couldn't get her mind around it. In fact, the more I began to talk, and I was just talking in conversational voice, the more I talked, she, she'd get irritated. And she said, oh, I got to go. And she up and moved away from me and went and sat by her boyfriend. And to be perfectly honest, I was glad for the leg room. Now, here, here it is. Here it is. Somebody that is living in an immoral, adulterous relationship, smoking pot, telling me not to eat cheeseburgers and Cheez-Its. But that's the confusion of this old liberal world we live in. Just confusion, utter confusion. When, look here. When you worship idols, when you refuse to believe in God, you believe anything. You believe anything. My son and I, 2014, in fact, it was just right after I was here in this area. We were up in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, we were there by ourselves, Nathaniel and I. And, and we were walking to church. The, the church was just catty corner across a, a big intersection in Chicago where we were staying, from where we were staying. And, and, and we started out, and this biker comes riding or walking his bike right here. I said, sir, I reached in my pocket. And I said, I'd like to give you a gospel track. And I reached out and gave him a gospel track. He said, oh, he said, I am an atheist. And I said, oh, oh, really? I said, you know what I said in that church right across there this morning? He said, no. I said, if I were not a Bible-believing Christian, the only th other thing I'd be is an atheist because nothing else makes sense. And he smiled like, boy, I got a notch in my belt. I said, but I can't be an atheist. And I said, do you know why? He said, why? I said, because atheism gives no plausible or logical reason for or explanation of suffering, sin, or death. You know what he began to tell me? How that the stars were coming down to earth and the animals were trying to speak to us and communicate. And my 12-year-old son stood off to the side and went like this. <laughs> now, folks, my 12-year-old son could figure out that's pure stupidity. But if you won't believe in God, you'll believe in anything. And at this particular point in 2 Chronicles 28, it is pure stupidity that leads to trouble. Someone says, preacher, you can't legislate morality. Excuse me, it already has been. It's called the Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah, and if a society refuses to base their laws and their lifestyle on the Ten Commandments that has already been given centuries and millennia ago, they are pretty soon, watch this, going to try to legislate their own morality or their immorality. Pretty soon, if they will not submit to the morality and the laws of God, then they will try to make up their own laws that are so bizarre and so confusing based upon their idolatry. And after a while, watch this, the very next step is they will make it illegal to worship God. 
That's the very next step in a society that turns its back on God. And so here, that's exactly what's happening. Verse number four, he sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, those that want to shout the loudest, we need this educational system for the children and we need this new law for the children and we need this. They throw the for the children in there as if we're all purely stupid and we can't see through all of that. Don't tell me you're for the children when you've been butchering them by the millions in the mother's womb. There's no room for you to even talk about morality. And now here in this passage, verse 5, this is why the word wherefore has that connotation. This is why. This is why this is taking place. Wherefore, the, re, the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. Number one is the hellish rebellion. Number two is the horrible reward. Horrible reward. Now, young people, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. You have a free will. You can make your choice. You can choose whatever you want to do, but you can't choose the consequences. And that goes for good or bad. You can choose to do what's wrong, but you can't choose the consequences. Once you've made your choice, it's out of your control. And such was the case here in 2 Chronicles chapter 28. Here it says, God, the Lord his God, delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. Watch it now. Watch it. Judah is here. Israel is here. Syria is to the north. And the Lord his God sends Syria, stirs up a foreign king to come down against Judah. To come down against uh, Judah. And in verse number 5, it says, They brought them to Damascus, and he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah an hundred and twenty thousand in one day. You suppose if this hurricane killed 120,000, I pray not. I pray that nobody will die. Amen. But you suppose if 120,000 people died, it would go on national news? Tomorrow, we're about to commemorate a day in 2001 where 3,000 people died. This is way more than 3,000. And they were all valiant men. Look at our text. Verse number 6, it says, They were all valiant men because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. 120,000 valiant men. That means soldiers. The best of the best. The fighters. Those in combat. Those that would be part of the marine recon and the special forces and the army rangers wiped out. Verse number 7, And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, that would be a northern tribe of Israel, part of Israel, slew Metziah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, that was next to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them, and brought them the spoil to Samaria. We're talking about Newport News, wiped out. We're talking about Hampton, Wiped out with, either wiped out or, or taken into captivity. We're talking, this is the number, 320,000 people totally displaced in one day. Why? Because of Ahaz's sin. Because of Judah's idolatry. Look here, we would be foolish to think as Americans just because we love our country and just because we have Christian foundations and just because we've had Bible principles and just because we've experienced revival and just because we, we send out missionaries that we're exempt from the judgment of God like Judah was. We're not the apple of God's eye. Israel is and always is and by the way still is. So why would we think that just because we have had 200 years of illustrious heritage, we're exempt. We're not exempt. Right. What God did to Judah, he could do to us because of our sin and our wickedness and our idolatry and our selfishness. With hellish rebellion always comes a horrible reward. Think of it. hundred and try, 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 try if you can to get your mind wrapped around 120,000 dead 120,000 graves, 120,000 obituaries, 120,000 caskets. Try to get your mind wrapped around 200,000 prisoners. We haven't seen these kind of numbers since World War II, since the Civil War. 200,000 prisoners, yes. Women, children, old people. Why? Because of sin. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose the consequences. It says in verse number 8, the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. Now let me explain what's happened just now just so that we can remember. 
Judah sins, led at the helm by Ahaz and his rebellion. God says, all right, that's enough. I'm not going to let you besmirch my name and ruin my testimony any longer. I'm stirring up Syria, a, a nation to the north, coming down against Judah. And on their way, they picked up Israel. Pekah, the son of Remaliah, comes, picks up Israel and their army. And Israel says, this is our chance to get back at Judah. We've always been looking for an opportunity. They come down and they wipe it out. 120,000 men die. Very powerful men, uh, like very powerful men like Metsai and Azrakum and Elkanah are, are killed. So the leadership's gone. And 200,000 are turned in a slave train all the way back. Behind camels, behind chariots, in a long line tied together, tethered. I want you not to be here in a nice temperature controlled auditorium tonight. I want you to be there in the hot Middle Eastern sun. I want you to hear the moan and groan of the captives. I want you to see the scorn of the Israelite soldiers as they mistreat their brethren. Now God sent Syria down. God didn't send Israel. Israel saw this as their opportunity to exact vengeance and to seize a platform to display their anger. And it is on this scene and on this day that God sends a holy man to interrupt it all. Look at verse number 9. But a prophet of the Lord was there. Thank God for that phrase. A prophet of the Lord was there. I wonder if that can be said about your family. That are devouring each other or, or choosing to walk away from God. I wonder if it can be said about your family. A prophet of the Lord was there. I wonder if it can be said about your job. A prophet of the Lord was there. I wonder if it can be said, I wonder if it can be said about your neighborhood. A prophet of the Lord was there. I wonder if people can know that they can turn to you to pray and to speak the truth in a time when they most need it. A prophet of the Lord was there right on the way back home. Verse number 9, whose name was Oded. Now we've heard of Isaiah. He was a prophet. But God didn't choose to use Isaiah. God chose to use Oded. I bet, I bet nobody in this room has even thought about Oded lately. Have you? I bet nobody in this room has named their son Oded. I bet nobody. Mrs. Canavan, that might be an option. If it's a boy, Oded. Little Oded running around. Think of it. Oded. Whose name was Oded, and he went out. Watch this. This is precious. He went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up unto heaven. And now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? Now hear me therefore and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. That was his entire sermon. Boy, was it powerful. It was powerful because he was willing to deliver it. It was powerful because he was standing against an army of Israel and 200,000 captives. How, how big of an army would have to take 200,000 captives? At least half that. At least one-third, that wouldn't you agree? 200,000 captives. Whew. He said, hold it. Stop right there. I've got a message for you, and it's a message from the Lord. He said, because of their sin, God delivered them to the hand of Syria, and you jumped on board. And you've killed all these people in a rage that reacheth up into heaven. You know what he was saying? Your anger stinks to high heaven. And God sent me tonight to stand in the way of your anger. The Bible says that anger resteth in the bosom of fools. The Bible says, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. The scripture says, make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare unto thy soul. The Bible says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath, 
but grievous words stir up anger. I wonder if I'm speaking to someone tonight who's just plain been angry. Angry at your situation. Angry at the world. Only the Lord knows how this could even possibly be, but angry at God. Angry at the one that bore nail prints in his hands for you. I, I don't know if it's just me or maybe it's someone else, but it sure seems to me like there's a whole lot of anger in this world. Politicians monopolize and seize upon the anger and try to channel it to their advantage. Hollywood stars model the anger. Uh, uh, people in the community are filled with anger about this, that, or the other thing. That might be the way the unsaved world belongs and behaves, but that's not the way Christians ought to behave. You say, preacher, you mean this never right to get angry? No, I'm not saying it's never right to be angry, but this is what the Bible says, be angry and sin not. That means there's an anger that's sinful and an anger that is not sinful. And I'll guarantee you the anger that is, is, sin, is not sinful doesn't boil over and over and over and over and over all the time. There's a limit. There's a, a governor. You know, if you didn't have a governor on your vehicle, it'd blow up. You say, oh, I just put the pedal to the metal. I'm going to show these people what for. Yeah, but you'll blow up your engine. Now, I'm going to preach a message someday on anger. I'm going to use as my points hot spot. Some people are just called hot spot. I mean, that's just, they're always hot about something, angry about something. Some people are called slow burn. They're not angry all the time, but boy, after a while, they think about it and think about it, think about it, and blow up at the most unexpected time. Natural combustion. You know what I'm talking about? My, 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 my sister-in-law, we were just up in Minnesota, and she had... She said, to, she said to my brother, she texted him and said, uh, there's a really strange smell. There's a really strange smell. I don't know what it is. And, and it's, it's coming from the fire pit. He said, well, what's in it? She said, just some rags from the garage that I threw out in the fire pit. Now, the fire pit wasn't on fire and there, were no, there hadn't been any fire in a long time. But those rags just naturally, spontaneously combusted. And they were filled with all kinds of oils and lacquers and thinners. Just combusted. That's the way some people are. You don't know when they're going to explode. Just all of a sudden, blah, boom, they've got stuff stirring in their heart and their mind. There's hot spot, there's slow burn. Then there's angry bird. Just angry all the time. <laughs> Mad at the world. Now, I'm not talking about the video game that some of you adults play. <laughs> we know teenagers play video games, but we know that some of you adults are playing video games when you get home. Isn't that right? Angry bird, just angry at the world, mad at everybody all the time. Want to blow something up? Just launch me. Just launch me. I'm going to blow it all up. <laughs> now, why is that? We ought to have the joy of God in our heart. There ought to be a peace in our soul that passes all understanding. Now, you, you see, I'm not saying that there are never times that we get angry. A Christian every once in a while in this world is going to get angry because of injustice. And injustice and sin ought to make us upset. But watch this. If we don't yield to the Holy Spirit of God, we are going to be such a terrible testimony to our spouse, to our children, to our job, to our fellow employees, to our boss, to our community. And shame on us. We have the king of kings and the prince of peace living within. We have the Holy Spirit of God living within. Why would we not yield to him? Why would we not let his peace rule in our hearts to the which also we are called? Can I interrupt your anger tonight? Maybe your anger is just covert. Maybe just a few, select few see it. Maybe your anger is manifested in just silence. I'll show them. Give them the silent treatment. Oh, no, the silent treatment. <laughs> this is terrible. Terrible how we as adults could behave and act when we know full well. I mean, honestly, sometimes the way us adults behave, it's, it's almost like we're in the nursery. <laughs> and shame on us for our anger. What a terrible testimony. Well, Oded was sent by God to say stop it all and stop it right now. And you know, thank God for number three, the holy reminder. The prophet. We don't know anything about Oded before this or after this. He doesn't write a major prophet. He doesn't write a minor prophet. But boy, thank God for this. Thank God he preached this message at this time and on this occasion. Look what happened in verse number 
11, after he says in verse 11, Now hear me therefore, and deliver the captives again, which you have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Again, this is what he said. God's wrath was against Judah because of Ahaz's sin, and God sent Syria down, not Israel, Syria. You jumped on the bandwagon, killed 120,000 in a rage that reaches to high heaven, and now you've taken 200,000 of your own brethren captive. You better turn this train around. You better abort your mission. You better stop your anger. You better calm down, and you better do it right Right now, if you don't, the wrath that God intended for Judah is coming to you. Notice verse 12. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Johanan, Berechiah, the son of Meshillamoth, Jehezkiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadlai, stood up against them that came from the war and said unto them, Ye shall not bring in the captives hither, for whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass, for our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So number four, you know what you see? Something sweet, something precious, something rare, something wonderful. You know what it is? A humble response. There was the hellish rebellion of Ahaz. There was the horrible reward against his sin. There was the holy reminder, the prophet. And now there's the humble response. Thank God for a humble response to preaching, to Bible preaching. Thank God when people get it right and keep it right. Thank God when people all of a sudden get it. You know, that's what I'm aiming for in a preaching service. And that's what I'm aiming for in a revival is for somebody to just get it. I'm looking for the light bulb moment when some carnal Christian just couldn't get it under the pastor's preaching, just wasn't getting it under the missionary's preaching, just wasn't getting it from the Sunday school teacher. But all of a sudden, not because the evangelist is special, but the power of the Word of God and all those things combined, all of a sudden, bing! the light comes on and the eyes start to see clearly and the glazed look is gone and the humble response comes and they start to respond like a normal righteous human being thank God for those that get it and that humbly respond not everybody gets it I wish I could say everybody got it and I'll tell you when I first went into evangelism one of the things that perplexed me more than anything else was why everybody didn't get saved do you understand that can anybody here explain that to me why they aren't knocking the doors of our church down to get to Jesus and to get to escape from hell and to get into the ark of safety. I don't understand that. I still don't understand that. I don't understand why everybody didn't get right with God. Are you kidding me? We're saved and we've got this little, little dash between two dates that we've got to live for God and we're not just clamoring to just get right with God and get everybody we can saved and win the people to Jesus Christ and get discipleship and build buildings and send out missionaries and fork over money so that we can support some more. Well, why doesn't everybody just sell out to God? I don't understand that. A boy, when it happens, and oh, when you see it, it's like a drink of fresh water. That's what they're doing here. They got it. All right, now I'm going to give you four points. Four points that I want to be the most important in our hearts and minds as to our humble response. When this anger wells up within us, when we think we're righteous in vengeance, when we think that we have a right to be bitter and hold a grudge, all right, there's four simple responses that you ought to have, and they're modeled by the people of Ephraim and Manasseh. Number one, see the chains. Would you say that with me tonight, please? See the chains. Would you say it again? See the chains. Once more, see the chains. When you think that you're righteous in, in binding someone and, 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 and tearing them down and, 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 and building yourself up and holding on to a grudge and being angry. When you think, hey, hey sir, you're angry at your children for, for this, that, or the other. All right, there's an understandable point and place for a father's anger against his children, but there's a place where it needs to stop. There is a line that the Holy Spirit clearly draws in your conscience and in mine that says, don't step over that line. You've said enough. You've made your point. Now you need to throw on grace. And when you cross over that line, you've grieved the Spirit. Every man in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. There's a point. There's a point when your anger becomes sinful. And sometimes it's when it first starts. See the chains. You don't have a right to be bitter. You don't have a right to exact vengeance. God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And last time I checked, he didn't delegate that responsibility to us. You don't have a right to hold a grudge. You don't have a right to be angry and hateful and resentful. You don't have a right to spread your venom everywhere and spew out your poison against others. You don't have a right, neither do I. 
Number one, see the chains. And if you look closely at this long line of 200,000 women, children, and see they're bound with tempers, they're bound with chains, they're bound like wild beasts to animals. And what are they going to be? The slave population of the northern ten tribes? Yes. And look at those chains. And some of those chains, if you look a little closer, are big and heavy, and they're digging into the hands of the captors. I mean, isn't that pain enough? I mean, isn't that, isn't that enough? And if you look closely, those links are linked one to another, to another, to another. And do you know what they are? They're wrapped around your own ankles. They're wrapped around your own hands. They're tied to your own neck. They've got you ankled at wrist. You see, bitterness doesn't kill the ones you hate. It kills you. Someone said bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping it kills the one you hate. That's true. See the chains. Look at verse number 5. It says in verse number 5 that they carried away a great multitude of them captives. Look at verse 8. The children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren, 200,000. Look at verse 10. That's what Oded preached about. You purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bond women, bond men and bond women unto you? Number one, see the chains. Number two, confess your stain. Confess your stain. Would you say it with me? Confess your stain. Would you say it again? Confess your stain. While you're oh so angry at them, maybe it'd be good to look in the mirror. See what the Lord has to deal with. See your own sin. Look at what the Bible says in verse 9. Uh, Oded said, uh, you, you've slain them in a rage that reacheth up unto heaven. In other words, God, God, you have God's attention. I'll tell you, I don't want my anger to get God's attention. I want my prayer life to get his attention. I want my humility to get God's attention. I want my holy living to get God's attention. He got God's attention when Job, Job was mentioned in the throne room. He said, have you considered my servant Job? What got God's attention? Job's holy living. I don't want my anger to get God's attention in a rage that reacheth up unto heaven. Look at what the Bible says in verse 10. He says at the end, are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord, your God? Whew. Look in the mirror. Confess your stain. You know, sometimes we think everything around us stinks. But maybe we ought to check our own lack of deodorant. Hmm? Maybe it's us. Maybe the stink is us. Maybe we're the problem. Easy to blame it on everybody else. Confess your stain. You know, I'm not sure how, but somehow we look in the mirror of God's word. And the Bible says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. Yeah. Do, you, do you know, it says in that, it says a man that hears God's word and does not do it is like unto a man. Sometimes when the word uses man, it's talking about men, women, boys, girls. But not in that verse. It's talking about the male gender. Whoso looketh into the perfect... Who, who, he, who, he that be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, a male, who beholdeth his natural face in a glass and goeth his way and forgetteth what manner of man he was. You know, why does it say male? What, why is it emphasizing that gender? Because a man looks in a mirror different than a woman. Can I get a witness right there, ladies? Do you know what... Men, i got to let you in on a secret. Do you know ladies have mirrors on their person right now? Guys carry guns, girls carry mirrors. <laughs> it's a fact. Some of you ladies, don't look at me funny. You ladies have the mirror app, or you just turn it to the camera. The selfie take it. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, teenage guys look in a mirror kind of like a lady, but most every other guy doesn't. Okay, I'm t no offense, teenage guys, but boy, y your parents know they got you modeling and flexing and bowing and all that sort of thing. And my little Andrew, he loves to look in the mirror. I said, hey, quit looking in the mirror. The mirror's right here. He said, I'm not looking in the mirror. I said, you're doing it right now. <laughs> but ladies, they look in the mirror totally different. They're looking for all the nuances, all the shades. They look at it at angles. Guys don't. They get up in the morning, they look at it once, brush their teeth, wash their face, comb their hair, and zoom, out the door, and they don't really ever have to look in it ever again. They don't comb their hair on the way. <laughs> Not ladies. Mm-mm. They're fixing it and straightening their makeup, whatever that means, and I mean getting it all right. That's what the Bible says. 
Watch this now. The contrast is a male. A male looks and forgets and forgets and goes on. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, this is the perfect law of liberty. It's the mirror of God's word. Do you know how a lot of people look in the mirror? Like this. I hope they're looking. I hope they're listening. Or like this. No, 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 no. Look at it like this. Confess your stain. All right, number three. Avoid more pain. Avoid more pain. Do you know this grudge could be over with tonight if you'd laid at the cross? Yes. This vengeance could be over with tonight if you'd give it to God. This hatchet could be buried tonight and you wouldn't have to bury it in the other person's head. Yeah. Right? Avoid more pain. Look at verse 11. He says, Now hear me therefore and deliver the captives again. For the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Verse 13, they said, For our trespass is great and there is fierce wrath against Israel. Some of the leadership of the armies of Israel came to and said, You know this little scrawny preacher, Oded, he's got a point. And we've seen how oh, God stirred up a foreign nation against Judah because of their sin. We don't want that against us. Turn this slave train around. Yeah. Avoid more pain. Praise God. All right, number four. Here it is. Are you ready? Here it is. See the chains. Confess your stain. Avoid more pain. Are you ready? This is a deep theological truth that I think will help you. Are you ready? Use your brain. <laughs> Would you say that with me? Use your brain. That's what parents are uh, they're taught to say to their teenagers. Use your brain. What were you thinking? <laughs> right? Use your brain. Use your brain. You said, preacher, how's that? Well, we'll look in verse number 14 and following in just a moment. But the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. And they turned the whole slave train around. Can I just say before we read the end of the passage, can I just say, listen to me, listen to me. Look, look right this way because this is a little physical illustration that will help me, okay? It'll help you. It'll help all of us, all right? Do what I do. Ready? Here we go. All right, do what I do. Ready? You know what that is? That's you or me when we don't obey the Bible. I'm not trying to be disrespectful now. I'm not trying to insult anybody, but that's a fact. Watch this. This is me. This is you whenever we're faced with Bible truth and we decide we know better. Here it is. What's wrong with her? I don't know. She won't obey the Bible. What's wrong with him? He hasn't been in church in, in months. I uh, just decided not to obey the Bible, going cuckoo, something's wrong. Lights on, but no one's home. What's wrong with him? I don't know. They just decided they, they, they know better than God and they can be bitter against anybody. Well, that's terrible. Don't they know what they're doing? No, I don't think they do. I think they're one fry short of a happy meal. What's wrong with her? Why, she's left her home and her marriage and her responsibilities. I don't know. Is that, you know, the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. Something's wrong with them. It is pure insanity to be faced with Bible truth that gives life and health and strength and go our own way. Yes, sir. All right, but watch. Now, the illustration has a positive note. Are you ready? Do what I do. It won't be quite as negative this time. Here we go. Do what I do. Ready? <laughs> What's that? Well, that's anybody that just decides to obey the Bible. Yeah. What happened? Did you see so-and-so in church? Yeah, I did. Well, what in the world? I haven't seen him in church. And they actually saying, yeah, I don't know. They're, they're coming too. I don't know. They're, coming. they're not having to be admitted to the loony bin. I don't know what happened to him, but they're all of a sudden, did you see him? I mean, he's actually got his arm around his wife and acts like he loves her. Yeah, I don't know. It sure is strange activity. About to give all of us a heart attack. We don't know how to behave around him when he acts like that. Hey, what, what happened? Oh, what, all of a sudden, just start to obey the Bible. When you and I start to obey the Bible, it's the smartest thing on the planet. Amen. And it is the height of stupidity to not obey the Bible. Yeah. Now, how come we can't get that? Look at how these people obeyed the Bible. This is precious. Verse number 15. And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them and arrayed them, and shod them, and gave them to eat, and to drink, and anointed them, and carried all the feeble of them upon asses, and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. 
Wow. Do you see what happened here? They, they saw the chains. They confessed their stain. They avoided more pain. And they used their brain. And they turned the whole thing around. Can't you see them? They take them down to Jericho. And can't you see the captives as the soldiers unsheathe the sword and they flinch? Oh, no, 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 please. There's been enough bloodshed. And they say, excuse me, excuse me. And they cut the tethers that have dug into their wrists all day long. Yes. Can't you see them as they take the naked and they cover them with clothes and they take the spoil of the sandals and they put them on the feet of the little ones and the women and the children and they take them back. And can't you see the women and the children who've been widowed and fatherless in one day as they look up to each other and say, Mama, Mama, what, what just happened? And the mama looks down with tears coursing through her dark and dirty cheeks. I don't know, honey, but I think forgiveness just happened. And I think grace just happened. And I think God just happened. Yes. Can't you see that? Watch this. God's anger was waxing hot against you and me, and the wrath of man was against God. And angry men took the Lord Jesus Christ and nailed him to the cross of an old rugged tree. And there he hung between heaven and earth, and he brought man to God. And we who come to Jesus by faith in Christ all of a sudden find our sin load gone and our chains gone. And afterwards we say, oh, what just happened? And someone says, I don't know. But I think Jesus interrupted our anger against God and God's anger against us. I think forgiveness happened. I think salvation happened. I think grace happened. Aren't you glad, ladies and gentlemen? Aren't you glad? Well, if that forgiveness has been bought and paid for and offered to you and to me and anger was interrupted on our behalf, don't you think it's just right and natural and normal for us to extend it to others yeah. whether they deserve it or not? Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer? Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You've been such patient attenders to the Word of God tonight. I wonder, has God interrupted your anger? Oh, we think we're right and justified in having our anger. Sometimes we're angry at a situation or a circumstance. Sometimes we don't know who to blame except God. And oh, what a foolish, foolish path. I wonder, has God interrupted your anger? You said, preacher, I'm saved. I'm blood bought. I'm heaven bound. But tonight, God's spirit has convicted my heart about anger and resentment and bitterness and vengeance and grudge holding. And I want to get it right. I want to lay it at the cross. I want to offer forgiveness. I want to receive God's forgiveness and good sense. And I want to offer forgiveness. If that's you, would you slip up your hand tonight? Slip it up high. God bless you. Good, good, good. Thank the Lord for these. Anybody else, preacher? God has spoken to me tonight about laying down my grudge and my unforgiveness and my revenge at the cross. I'm going to do it tonight. Anybody else? Slip up your hand. Put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Question number two, how many of you can say, preacher, I'm not perfect, but I know I'm saved. I'm not hoping I'll get to heaven or trying my best to get there. I know I'm going because I've accepted the free gift of eternal life. Now, if you don't know that, don't raise your hand. But if you do, would you slip your hand up as a testimony to that fact? Yes, I know I'm saved. I'm heaven bound. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Is there anybody here that's a preacher? I don't know. I've not been saved. I don't know that my sins are forgiven, but I'd like to know. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you slip your hand up right now? Is there anybody young or old here like that? Anybody young or old? All right, let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. This is what I'd like. I'd like Brother Canavan to come and sing a few verses of invitation song. And as he prepares to sing, God spoke into your heart. You respond. Listen carefully. Some of you need to come to this altar and get right, but listen. Some of you, after you get right with the Lord, need to go across the aisle to someone in this church and get right. Don't leave without taking that step. Again, maybe you need to go grab their hand. Say, would you come with me? I, I just want to talk to you. I just want to ask for your forgiveness for my unforgiveness. And I want to offer you my forgiveness. Now is as good a time as any. As he sings and the pianist plays, would you come? Come on right now. Come on. Whatever the Lord leads. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant. Amen. 
it. How about it? Don't be ashamed or afraid to respond to the Lord. Love beheld forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to playing through this next verse. God's Spirit is moving right now. How about we just get right? You used to preach this thing of forgiveness. It's just messy. It is. But it's a whole lot messier than having to deal with unforgiveness. The consequences are a whole lot greater. God's in the business of reconciling enemies. He's in the business of reconciling us to himself and giving us the ministry of reconciliation. God's dealing with you. Would you respond? Would you sing that chorus? God's speaking to your heart. Now's the time to respond. Oh, to be like thee. again without the instruments. Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed The Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, and be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I can't help but think people have not responded to the Lord. They ought to be responding to the Lord tonight. It's hard to admit things like this. In fact, as a preacher was preaching, I... Uh, I'll have to go home and apologize to my family for the way I behave before church tonight. That's the truth. I got in a, we got in a pinch about how long it was taking us to get ready and get here. And I wasn't very nice. But we're going to be stuck right here until you decide to forgive, until you decide to move ahead with what God wants. You're going to be stuck and quite honestly, our entire church could be stuck right there, waiting on revival. That's just the truth of it. And maybe it's hard to do. Vance Abner, the great revival preacher, said, The church is so subnormal that if it ever got back to the New Testament normal, it would seem to people to be abnormal. Forgiving people is abnormal. But this is right where we live. These are the kind of sins that dressed up Christians commit don't we and I can't help but think we still need to respond to the Lord is God speaking to your heart I'm not going to belabor things but I know the Lord's speaking to my heart and I want God to give us all that he wants and if we stay here we're going to be stuck here I surely don't want to get stuck here on Monday night We've got a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, Thursday night, God willing, a Friday night, God willing. I don't want to be stuck here. May God continue to deal with us. God continue to deal with us. And I'm praying God won't leave me alone. He won't leave you alone until you deal with it. Until you deal with it. And uh, you know what you need to do.
You know who you need to speak to. Begin by speaking to the Lord. And if you need to speak to somebody, by all means, do it. Father, I pray that you'll work in our hearts. We've been confronted with our own sin. Thank you for giving the preacher the boldness to preach the Bible. And Lord, I pray that there will be a spirit of forgiveness in our church and in our homes. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us. This is a sin that we can get away with so easily. That's a sin I've gotten away with so easily. It's a sin that I've justified because I might be right about something, but I'm not behaving righteously. And so, God, I pray you would not leave us alone until we confess, until we forgive, until we repent, until we get right with others. And I pray that that would happen with the people in this room. Lord, we don't want to be stuck here. We want to move ahead with thee. So I pray your Holy Spirit would prove yourself and, and do a work we can't do. I pray you'd see it, help us to see it through. Lord, give us the humility we need to obey you in this area. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. If you're glad for what the preacher said tonight, would you say amen? amen. That's one of those pills that's hard to swallow. Hard to swallow. But you know, it's like I said, that's one of the things that you and I can get away with. We can't get away with cussing like a sailor. <laughs> well, somebody will hear that. Can't get away with running around half drunk. Somebody will find out about that. Can't get away with robbing a the bank. They'll find out about that. But we can be mean as a snake. And a lot of people never know about it. We can harbor bitterness in our heart. And usually only the people that live with us can testify about it. Now, that's a shame, isn't it? But I believe it. And if that's going on in this church, we're going to be stuck right here until we deal with it. So that's up to us, really. The preacher has preached. God's used him, hasn't he? Amen. And uh, I sense a holy hush in my own heart. I love you. I know you love me. But we need to hear things like this. We need to hear it. Because the preacher could preach about smoking and drinking and drugs all day long, and we're on the right side of that. I believe we are, God willing. All right? We're on the right side of that. But when he starts preaching right here, boy, I tell you what, he hits us right in the heart. If we're going to be like Jesus, I think this is one of the areas I know I have to address. Let's pray God will continue to do his work. Amen. Amen. You've been patient to be here. We want the Lord to have, have his time to work. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. We'll be back together tomorrow night for a prayer meeting at 630. And let's work on getting some folks here. Uh, and wear your red, white, and blue. I tell you, I love America, don't you? And I want to see America come back to the Lord. And maybe tomorrow night, God, do something special there. Let's work on that and encourage people that way. Let's continue to pray for folks that have needs. And pray about this storm. Let's pray that the Lord will just send this thing away. Uh, will not, not, not uh, hurt people and disrupt people in that way. We, we need to have a burden about that. Now let's pray together as we're dismissed tonight. And as we leave, I'll ask Brother Jim Alvo if he would to pray for us as we leave. <laughs>